Hi, it's Tom from Green Shorts, and today I want to show you how I made my hybrid Hugo Culture Wallapini greenhouse so I can grow cold weather vegetables here in Georgia during the winter. I've got most of my materials staged already. The back wall of the greenhouse is going to be a Hugo Culture bed. I'm actually going to use a box spring frame that I found on the side of the street uh, to to make up that structure. The front wall of the greenhouse is going to be formed, at least for this season, using bales of hay. I'll probably replace those next season with adobe. Got a couple of pallets here that I'm going to use for the structure of the greenhouse and the beginnings of the logs here for the hugo culture. And some of these are actually uh, left over from or finished mushroom logs grew shiitake mushrooms for a couple of years in these, but eventually they uh, stop producing. They give up their nutrients. You can see the dowels here, the dowel spots from where the spores were injected. And then I've got a pile of composted material. It's mostly wood and grasses and it's turned into soil now. I'm gonna use that for the hookahulter bed on the top layer. I've got some concrete screen here as well. I'm not sure how I'm gonna use that, but uh, it's a material I have on hand if I need it. The low slung greenhouse is going to cover this bed on the right and then include a second bed on the left. It'll be centered around a trench here in between the beds. That will serve as an area for me to stand inside the greenhouse and it'll also serve as a cold sink, allowing cold air to drop and settle in that low area. And finally, it will serve as a heat source for the greenhouse, allowing the ambient heat of the earth into the air. I'm gonna go ahead and dig in the box springs here in the back to stabilize it and help it be vertical and level. I also wanna make sure I'm square to the front garden bed. I'm gonna use some wire I salvaged from my silt screen to wire the box springs to the post. I don't want to lose a lot of moisture out of the back of the hoogle, so I'm going to cover the back of the box springs with a layer of plastic and then a more durable layer of upcycled silt screen.
I'm gonna secure it on the bottom as well. I left the silt fence long on both ends because I'm going to wrap it around the sides to cover the sides of the greenhouse. Now it's time for the trench. If this were a Coen Brothers movie, I'd be getting worried about now. Time to bring in the reinforcements. Not bad. Thumbs up. All right, let's get to work. Let's do this. The hay bale front wall is going to start right here, but I've got a little bit of a slope to deal with, so I'm going to level this out with some wood chips first. Then we'll put the bale in, and then put one rafter in, so I can get a sense for how deep we got to finish the trench in order for me to be able to stand up in the greenhouse. So I think this is as deep as I need to go. I'm just gonna raise the rafters just a little bit more and then I'll have the clearance I need to, to get in the greenhouse without having to stoop. Also, this nice deep cavity here is bleeding out nice ambient heat from the earth. In fact, it actually feels warmer down in this hole, just being down in here compared to um, above ground. So you can already feel the heat coming out. Thanks for your help. 
Many hands make light the work. So it's night. I'm going to walk out in the backyard. I've got my thermal camera on my phone. And I'm going to record a little video clip so you can see how the trench is doing in terms of temperature. You can see the trench outlined. Got the two beds. Well, the, the grass over here, the ambient is 37 degrees. 36, 37 and as we move down into the trench, you can see that where it's the deepest, we're at almost 50 degrees. So huge temperature difference. And once I get this contained in a greenhouse, that heat will then begin to uh, change the air temperature inside the greenhouse. I've got a bunch of short 2x6s and 2x8s that I scavenged from my house being constructed. And I'm going to use those to build a beam along the top of the hay bale wall and also along the top of the box spring. I'm using this reclaimed pallet to put a, a nicer face on the hay. I'm also attaching the bottom of my beam to the top of the pallet. I guess this front wall is just temporary. I'm just gonna hold it up with a couple of tilt fence posts. And I'll add two by sixes to the beam. In the end, I decided to push in the hay bale a little bit so that my three hay bales went all the way along this side of the garden bed. Even though I lost a little bit of the corner here, it's going to be covered and it won't matter. And I still have a nice thick layer in this corner to keep that uh, section of the bed warm. is almost done with the trench. Nice work, son. <laughs> I'm going to use a pallet for the wall on this end of the hoop culture bed. And I'll level it out and put a hay bale in front. It'll help with insulation, but it'll also make the profile of this side of the greenhouse uniform. Because the box spring itself isn't going to be strong enough to support the weight of the beam, I'm going to put in a couple of 2x6 posts to provide extra support.
gonna lower the floor about another inch and I'm gonna be good to go. Before I start the back sidewall of the greenhouse, I'm actually going to remove the topsoil and grass, uh, organic material, from where the hookah culture bed is going to go. So I can start to put that in. I'm actually running out of space back there, and I've got some, some soil I want to put in here. And so I need to move this out, because I want this topsoil to be close to the top of the hookah culture bed, because that's already ready to grow plants in. The bottom of the bed is going to be the logs and wood chips and things like that that are going to take some time to decompose and break down before they can start releasing nutrients. For the time being they're going to be absorbing nitrogen so I want them away from the plant at least to start. I'm going to dig one more little trench here in the culture side of the greenhouse because I don't want the water running underneath it and going into the trench. So I'm going to dig a trench down the middle here and then it will wrap, wrap around this side as well. While the culture bed will absorb a lot of moisture, probably all of it that comes in, I do want to give it a way to drain if it needs to. The ground is frozen today. harder when the ground's frozen. I've got a hogo culture bed over here that I have had cooking but haven't used yet. And I'm actually going to move the organic material from it into the greenhouse bed mainly because I want to put a keyhole garden over in this space. So let's take apart this hogo culture bed and see what the material looks like inside it after probably about a year and a half of cooking. Ooh. 
There's a toad down in there in the gaps of the logs. This guy found a warm spot down in the bed there. I'm gonna have to transfer him to and get him put him under these bales of hay over here. Oh, you're slow, buddy. You're moving slow. Let's keep you warm. Hopefully he'll be okay for the winter. These logs are frozen together, but we've got some nice mycelium action going here, which is what you want to see. Mushroom roots starting to work their way through the wood, break it down. I'm gonna keep my eye out for more toads here. This is a big hunk of oak, and it's still pretty sturdy. Doesn't seem to have rotted a lot yet, so I'm gonna put this in the bottom of the new hookah culture bed. You actually want to put your biggest biomass, biggest logs, in the bottom of the bed. I also recommend putting any new or freshly cut wood in the bottom as well. Before I go any further, I'm gonna fill in some of the nooks and crannies here with some wood chips. Before I add more sticks and twigs and branches, I'm gonna seed this layer with some older wood chips that already have mycelium growing in them. It'll help jumpstart the biology in the lower layer of the hugel. Now I'll start transferring the organic material, wood chips, soil, from my old hugel culture bed. So today's my day to finish the greenhouse, and it's rainy. Sometimes you just gotta go. And actually the rain's gonna help me in one capacity, and that is that as you build a hugel culture bed, it's good to wet it down, to soak it, at, at each layer. So the last three days of rain have been nicely preparing my hugel culture bed. So we'll try and not get too muddy. You get a good chance to see what Georgia clay turns into when it gets wet. It ain't pretty. When the rain came a couple days ago, I put a tarp over the trench because I didn't want it to get full of water. Let's see if I was successful. Yeah, it looks like it's pretty dry under there but I left the hugo culture bed exposed because I did want it to get wet so that looks nice and moist excellent what I'm worried about is that so today I brought the boots out a little extra support for the back wall. 
untreated stringers free from Home Depot. Before I build the hoogle any bigger in the back, I'm gonna fill the cavity in the box springs with fresh wood chips. These will help insulate the back of the greenhouse and because they're fresh, they'll take a little longer to decompose. sure it won't take long for this part of the box springs to rot out. I'm actually okay with that. That's why I put the metal part on the outside. Now this greenhouse is probably going to be a two to three year, maybe maybe four year uh, duration or of existence, a, a lifespan if you will. I'm out of breath. But that's okay because I'm using reclaimed upcycled materials that would otherwise be in a landfill. So I'm happy for this wood to rot here and this steel to rust here instead of taking up space in a landfill. That's part of why I really love using reclaimed materials. That and they're free. Here's what happens with the Georgia clay when it gets muddy. Got a nice inch or so thick on the bottom of my boot. I'm about 12 inches from where the hoogle is going to stop. So this is the point where I'm going to add the topsoil, the grass, the sod that I dug out underneath. I'm going to do my best to make the grass stems facing down. That'll help them not reroot and come up through the top of the bed. One of the nice things about leaving the sod in place like that is that there's still some biological communities in there. So we haven't broken down the soil completely. We left that root structure together. Whew, not a shape. Left the root structure together and preserved the biological, bacterial, micro community that's there. That's gonna actually help get this bed going more quickly on the biological level. With a nice layer of topsoil, I'm gonna add one more layer of smaller sticks and branches. All right, now I'm gonna put the rest of my old hugaculture compost slash wood chips that are already in the process of breaking down. Let them mix down in here. This is gonna be nice, rich. The last thing I'm gonna to add to this bed is the finished compost that I dug out of an older compost bin. But before I do that, I got a few more, another pot full of this, these older wood chips that already have some mycelium growing in them. I'm gonna use that to kind of mix in with this, fill in the back and down here in front a little bit more, and then we'll put on the finished compost. And then this bed's gonna be done. This stuff was on the ground, which is great because it's been soaking up water for six months, eight months. But it's also territory for composting worms. They're in that top layer of soil where you got a lot of organic matter. So I may pick up some free worms in the process here. You can see I've got 
a pretty decent slope going here. But that's okay. The main concern with the slope garden would be erosion. But because this thing is going to absorb pretty much every ounce of water I can drop on it, I'm not worried about erosion. So what this does do is instead of having a flat two and a half feet of garden space, I got a hypotenuse going here. I think that's right. The long side of a triangle. I have that much more gardening space, eh, maybe another row or two, depending on how tightly I plant. But the hugo culture bed gets you more space in your garden. All right, that one bucket didn't go as far as I wanted it to, so I'm gonna get one more. I've been pruning a little bit as I go. Stuff that's sticking up from the top here, I'm just breaking it off or pulling it out. And notice there's some leaves mixed in with my wood chips, which is another great source of carbon for the hoogle. All right, now we're gonna add our top layer of soil. For reference purposes, this stuff is two years old basically of a frame of sticks and grass weeds that I started that thing before this house was here. We owned the land a year, about a year and a half before we built. I built a compost bed here almost right away since we only lived about five minutes away and started taking broken, you know, just the sticks and stuff from around the lot and the weeds and starting my compost. So now here, Two years later, I got this super awesome, super awesome, rich soil that I can put into a garden. That makes me happy. The final layer on this is actually gonna be another small thin layer of wood chips just to keep the weeds down, insulate the soil a little bit, keep moisture in. All of the logs in the bottom of this hoogle is they start to decompose, so soak up water like a sponge. Then that water is going to be available to the plants here in the top of the garden. All right, so there's the hoogle. Now I'm gonna build a hoogle around this edge of the garden as well, but I'm not gonna put that in this video. I think this is plenty enough demonstration for this. I'll also do a little watering on this hoogle to really uh, soak it well uh, to get, get everything locked in, let this settle in real well. The best way to do the watering would be rainwater, by the way, just because there is no chlorine in that. It wouldn't be harmful to all the good biology that's happening in this, in this material. So if you don't have the option of doing rainwater, you can also use tap water, but let it sit out for overnight and all the chlorine will evaporate out of the water. But that's one way you can get rid of the chlorine so the water doesn't counteract all the good stuff happening in here. All right, here's a cold hard reality. There's a lot more on my task list to finish this project than I can do today. Well, the rain's a little bit uncomfortable, but uh, so there are a lot of details in this hugoculture section. So this is probably a good place to stop, especially with the rain picking up. So there'll be a part two on this video to take you the rest of the way. Our mission at Green Shorts is to help you see green so you can be green and save a little green by doing it yourself. Thanks so much for watching. Please like and share and subscribe for a new DIY video or live stream almost every Friday.